Hey everybody, welcome to the third episode of Firearms and Film. I've been really anticipating doing this episode because it involves one of my favorite movies, Predator. I remember first seeing the movie Predator when my dad was watching it on television when I was about 10. I have no idea where my dad got the videotape at, but it was a recorded one, missing the first three minutes from the opening sequence. For the longest time, that meant that I thought that the opening of Predator started right when the commandos started filing out of the helicopter on the beach. Imagine my surprise when years later I bought the DVD, unwrapped it, popped it in for a little bit of nostalgia, and saw that there was an entire opening sequence showing the Predator spaceship jettisoning into the Earth's atmosphere. Predator fostered an appreciation for Arnold Schwarzenegger that still lingers 20 years later. If I ever catch a copy of Red Heat just hanging out in the Walmart $5 bin, I'll probably pick it up and buy it. Now for a refresher of Predator's premise. Spoiler warning. An elite team of hardened commando types are airdropped into the jungles of South America. Over time, we see the Special Forces unit transform from a group of hardened soldiers who work as a precision team to being increasingly erratic and uncertain as they face an enemy who seems to vanish into thin air. The firearms for each soldier are as varied as the characters themselves. So, without wasting any more minutes, let's move on to the guns. Welcome everybody to Top 5 Firearms in Film, a series where we take a look at some of the firearms through movie history. It's part education, part film analysis, and part commentary. From Blaine's big six-barrel M134 to Poncho's revolver-style grenade launcher, here are the top five firearms in Predator. Sometimes it pays to be accurate in films with certain movie props, and other times the audience couldn't care less. This is one of those instances. I don't like to use the word fake to describe any weapon that's made up to be something that it's not, the Podebrin from Red Heat for example, because everything in movies is inherently fake to an extent. It's part of our expectation, to be deceived. But without going too much into the philosophic nuance of negotiated audience expectation, let's just talk about why the M16 that Dutch uses is not an actual M16. And let's also talk about the grenade launcher he has as a secondary weapon and how it is not designed to launch grenades. Primary weapons with secondary functions is an actual thing. M16 rifles did have grenade launchers. The M203 grenade launcher utilizes a variety of ordnance, both explosive and less than lethal, in their 40mm configuration. They could also be sometimes used with flares for signaling. The civilian equivalent, however, is 37mm and is designed to be used solely as a flare gun. At least, that's how it's marketed. I doubt that very many people use these just because of their flare launching ability. I mean, it does look pretty cool hanging off the bottom of an AR-15. Several companies have produced such flare launchers over the years and have aimed to at least have them outwardly, at a glance, resemble the real thing. For Major Dutch's two-for-one weapon, the underslung flare launcher is just that, a flare launcher. But most people wouldn't know the difference. I didn't know the difference until I did some research. I just knew what it was supposed to represent. Again, it's not fake. It's portrayed as one weapon by using another. Why would an armorer do this? Probably for the reasons a person would expect. It's cheaper and easier to make civilian weapons and dress them up to present them as their military counterparts. Some of the major differences have to do with function. The M203 grenade launcher, actually utilized by the military, cocks on closing the breech and does not require a separate cocking action to ready the firing pin. In addition, the M203 actually has a rifle barrel, as opposed to the flare launchers, which are smoothbore. Actual M203 grenade launchers can be bought, and some do pop up from time to time. But, this is mostly at auction houses specializing in military weaponry, and who can provide prospective buyers with the paperwork and guidance necessary to acquire those grenade launchers. M203 grenade launchers in 40mm, because of their rifled nature, and because of their bore, have to be registered as destructive devices, as does each grenade that you buy for it, and grenade rounds can run to about $200 a pop. So, for movie armors back in the earlier days of action films, it's easy to see why they chose the flare launcher as opposed to an actual M203 grenade launcher. It was less paperwork, less expense, and less headache to modify existing civilian weapons to make them look and, most of the time, function like military ones. It's the same deal with the M16. What Dutch is carrying is not an actual M16. 
The M16 standard issue rifle has several iterations and countless configurations, from compact carbine sized rifles for use inside tanks, to longer barreled versions for marksmanship and sharpshooting. Invariably, the civilian market followed suit and the semi-automatic Colt AR-15 was sold to the public. Much like the 37mm flare launcher, the suitability and ease of acquisition for these civilian rifles made it a far better choice for armorers to buy, rather than going through the hassle of getting an actual M16. Both rifles are chambered in the same 5.56x45mm NATO round, and for all intents and purposes, they are almost duplicates of one another, except of course for a few key differences. The most obvious would probably be the lack of a small button near the ejection port just below the charging handle towards the rear carrying handle. This button is called a forward assist and is used to force a cartridge that is out of battery. These are present on the military versions of the M16 but completely absent on civilian versions. There are some earlier military rifles without this feature but for the most part this is a good indication that it's a converted rifle. Another indicator is the absence of a magazine fence, a small ridge that is incorporated into the lower receiver to prevent accidental release of a magazine, especially in the frenzied and hectic environment of live fire combat. To top it all off, Dutch's rifle lacks a shell deflector just behind the ejection port. As I said earlier, there's nothing wrong with any of this in the least. It's just like a costume or a set piece. It stands to represent something. But with film analysis comes film revelations like this, and Firearms and Film aims to educate. Before we go any further, I'd also like to point out for the more astute viewer that sometimes you can see the blank firing adapters for the rifles protruding out into the flash hiders. This is especially evident on Max M60, but Dutch's AR-15 as well. Again, I'm not nitpicking, it's just something to point out. If it's firepower you're looking for, you found it. If you managed to miss anything in the movie Predator, this gem was surely not one of them. Old Painless is the appellation Sergeant Blaine gives to this six-barreled monstrosity, but I'd have to say that shooting this thing is probably like firing a volley of supernovas, and that's gotta be painful. Just a little bit. The thing that makes this gun so menacing, aside from its rapid fire capability, is its portability. It's like sticking lasers on the heads of sharks. It's so ridiculous it passes through the realm of ridiculousness and somehow manages to find its way back to awesomeness. I love this gun personally, but we'll get to that in here in a minute. Something of this size is only befitting for someone of Jesse Ventura's stature and build. Arnold would get his chance at using one in Terminator 2 Judgment Day, but that was in a whole different decade, the 90s. Blaine's unveiling of the minigun occurs early in the film and its reveal leaves you begging to see it in action. At the time this movie was released, nobody had really even seen anything like it before. It's not long after though that Blaine unleashes the rotary gun fury during their incursion into the gorilla camp. Blaine becomes a veritable angel of death, shredding humans and grass huts with indiscretion. He walks like judgment and belches thunder. We're talking a firing rate that was dialed down from the GE minigun's average of 4,000 rounds per minute to only a paltry 1,200 rounds per minute, and it still looks incredible. Instead of a muzzle blast, the minigun spouts fire and lead death. It was the minigun's incredible rate of fire and novelty that prompted its appearance in countless video games and later movies as well. It garnered a reputation as being the ultimate squad weapon, passing into the realm of the mythical. It's the King Arthur's sword of guns, but like the fabled blade of King Arthur, a man portable minigun is just that, a fantasy. Now don't get me wrong, I love this gun, but I have no illusions about its practicality nor its feasibility. I want to talk about it because, as a Predator movie fan, I think it's important to understand where we are with regards to one of the greatest gun icons in history. So bear with me. Let's talk about practicality for a moment. The question is, can a man portable rotary cannon like the GE minigun be deployed while remaining practical? For that, we'd have to briefly discuss the purpose of miniguns and their roles in the armed services. Miniguns were initially designed to lay down an immense amount of firepower in a short amount of time. We're talking about something called saturation, wherein a tremendous amount of ordnance is aimed at a target, usually more than is necessary to eliminate that target. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the term saturation bombing. Well, this is kind of the same concept, but with bullets. The minigun is showing having a high rate of fire in Predator, but what we see in the movie is actually much slower than the M134's maximum firing rate of 6,000 rounds per minute. The recoil of such a weapon 
at that rate of fire with that caliber is not controllable, whether you're Jesse Ventura, a Predator, or even a Terminator. Sorry, wrong fandom. And by not being controllable, I mean it will knock a person over. The recoil energy alone is estimated to be somewhere around 850 newtons. So how is it implemented and used in combat? Well, it has to be affixed to a vehicle, especially outfitted with a pod-style modular mounting system. Vehicles can range from Humvees to helicopters and anything in between that is capable of remaining stable while the gun is fired. Recoil is the greatest enemy for a potential user of a person portable minigun to overcome. Why not slow down the minigun and have the rate of fire to be something more manageable, like what they did on Predator? The firing rate of the gun in the movie was a relatively paltry 1200 rounds per minute. It could be done, but even Jesse Ventura commented on how wickedly terrifying it was to shoot the minigun used in the film, saying it was like, quote, firing a chainsaw, end quote. After Sergeant Mack's minigun rampage, I would probably have to agree with him. So, how does this factor in? Well, it kind of defeats the purpose of the minigun's six rotary barrels. Barrel cooling at higher rates of fire is essential. Even on certain rifles like M16s, M4s, and submachine guns like the MP5 and FNP90, a shooter has to manage their weapon in such a way to allow the barrel to cool. Hot barrels tend to lead to poor barrel harmonics and less accuracy. The weapon's firing mechanisms will also begin to soak up a lot of the heat from the barrel. Let's look at the minigun's highest rate of fire, 6,000 rounds per minute. As fast as a person can pull and release the trigger, they've probably already sent 100 rounds down range. That's a lot of bullets. But divide that number by 6 barrels and you've got somewhere around 16 rounds per barrel. That's one-sixth the amount of heat and wear. This becomes important the harder and faster you want to push those rounds down the barrel. So, how is this relevant? If you cut the firing rate down, then you lose the advantage that 6 barrels provides you as anything 1200 and below can be just as easily achieved in a lighter package. A good analogy for me, being a car guy, is it's kind of like throttling down a race car and trying to tune 8 cylinders to get the fuel economy of 4. Just drive the 4 cylinder. The minigun's high rate of fire also leads us to another problem. It's ammo hungry as in more voracious than any Hotchkiss, 50 caliber, or Maxim ever devised. Gunners who man the minigun often dial back the rate of fire to around 4,000 rounds per minute. Still incredibly fast, but they can better control how much ammunition they're using up while maintaining an adequate rate of fire for saturation firing. However, ammunition equals weight. That's one caveat of carrying around a gun that eats up ammo. It's why M16s and M4s have fire selectors for ammunition conservation. The weight disadvantage for any weapon system for a soldier on the ground has to be offset by the advantage to the same soldier for any given mission or objective. There is no situation that occurs frequently enough to warrant designing and developing a portable M134 minigun. But, while we're on the topic of weight, the M134 also requires a power source. In the movie, it's portrayed as having some kind of gas recoil operation that doesn't require external power, but in reality, this isn't so. While there are four barrel rotary guns developed in Russia that work off a gas operating system, these weigh in at around 40 pounds, and that's not counting the ammunition. That's still pretty heavy. As for the minigun, the power pack I'm talking about isn't the 20 volt lithium ion you hook up to your portable drill. In order to run the customized M134 minigun, a cable had to be threaded down through the leg of Jesse Ventura's fatigues and off screen to a set of three helicopter batteries. This is because the cycling system is electrically driven. The two reasons that occur to me, more than likely, is that you can produce an incredible rate of fire with an electrical breech loading system and it be more reliable, and also, should you have a jam or a round that doesn't fire, it's automatically ejected without the need for clearing the breech manually because the electric motor will keep cycling the barrels whether the gun is firing or not. Now, let me be nostalgic for a moment. I love the GE minigun and Predator. I want it to work, and the 13 year old that I am at heart believes it can work. But what it boils down to is practically designing the weapon so that it's not massive and cumbersome, and to be honest, from an action movie lover's point of view, that's kind of the whole point to it. We want a gun like this to be loud and be seen. The GE M134 minigun was engineered with a designated purpose in mind, and it fulfills that role beautifully. But as a portable weapon for tobacco spitting future state governors, not so much. Still though, it's awesome to see Blaine tear away the canvas and chamber that beast while saying with a scowl, Payback time. With the lineage reaching back all the way to the 1960s, the German-designed MP5 has taken on the role of both battle rifle and police firearm for armed forces the world over. 
Chambered and 9mm pistol cartridges with some specialized versions firing the 40 caliber Smith & Wesson round, the customizable nature and adaptability of the MP5 has made the submachine gun about as varied as the global users who carry it. But much like Dutch's M16, what we see in Predator is not the MP5, but the civilian version, which bears the designation HK94. Again, the same reasons apply here as in the case of the M16. It was much easier for armorers to acquire HK94s and modify them for full auto of firing rather than buying outright the guns they were portraying. Oftentimes, the civilian models will be nearly identical in form and function to their military counterparts, with the exception of select fire capability. But, as any heckler and cook enthusiast will tell you, one of the biggest gripes about the civilian model HK94 is that it lacks one critical feature, the magazine release paddle. On the MP5, the magazine release paddle is a small lever located behind the magazine well and is used to release the magazine. On the civilian model HK94, this is not the case. Rather, it uses a button-style magazine release. Understandably, this caused some disappointment for those who had familiarized themselves with a submachine gun and were hoping to be able to purchase in semi-automatic form the MP5. Yet another obvious distinguishing feature is the barrel length. An HK94, due to restrictions on what's classified as a sporting arm in the United States, is sold with a 16-inch barrel, as opposed to the much shorter barrel of the MP5. This of course led to movie armories and gunsmiths chopping down these barrels for the movie stand-ins, but it also led to one critical missing piece, the three barrel lugs that protrude out from the circumference of the barrel of an authentic MP5. Since the civilian barrels are cut down, they are smooth on the outside and lack these barrel lugs. This is especially noticeable in the scene with Dylan and Mac at the gorilla camp when Mac skewers a scorpion on Dylan's shoulder. It is also most obvious when Dylan goes up against the predator. In an effort to perhaps redeem himself, Dylan volunteers to go after Mac when Mac goes AWOL after seeing the Predator escape the snare trap. Dylan catches up with Sergeant Mac and the two formulate a plan, but the Predator, sly as it is, sneaks up on Mac and kills him with a single shot to the forehead. Ouch. Dylan, now on his own, sees the Predator approaching. In a last ditch effort to at least wound the Predator, he fires one of the HK-94s. A man in his position had to know that death was coming, and Dylan's death was a noble one. With his arm amputated by a blast from the Predator's cannon, Dylan still has the presence of mind to pull his spare submachine gun and shoot just seconds from being killed. A Grenadier's Dream while there are grenade launchers that feature rotating cylinders and are fired like a shoulder-mounted oversized revolver, this one is a one-off fabrication. Pancho keeps the grenade launcher stowed away in a sack on his back for a majority of the movie, pulling it out and firing it during the raid on the guerrilla camp. He uses it to some effect to flush out a machine gun nest right after Ventura says, I ain't got time to bleed. Later, Pancho takes it out when he takes part in raising the forest during Mac's minigun rampage scene. Poncho's weapon is actually a pyrotechnic launcher. Chambered in 37mm, it was designed to launch flares and was mounted on aircraft during World War II. It consisted of a rotating assembly of chambers. The entire mechanism was an integral part of the plane and were operated either mechanically or electrically. They most certainly weren't the handheld shoulder-fired weapon that Poncho has and required some modification to work in this manner, but it's certainly more feasible than the GE minigun that Blaine's got strapped to his chest. While the U.S. Armed Forces utilize grenade launchers with revolving cylinders, such as the Mark 14, these use the same grenades as their underslung M320 counterparts with a 40mm bore. In the movie Predator, the shoulder stock looks like it has been transplanted from an HK MP5 and is prominent whenever Poncho has the weapon stowed away on his back. Most revolver type grenade launchers like this do not use a ratcheting action like a traditional revolver, but rather a winding system with a mainspring which puts tension on the cylinder and must be wound prior to firing. Each successive trigger pull allows the spring to release the cylinder and cycle it. The M60E3 is actually not intended as a weapon to be used solely with one person. Rather, two soldiers at minimum, three soldiers at most, are required to run the gun, with one responsible for ammunition, one responsible for carrying spare barrels for barrel changes, and the other person being responsible for actually firing it. Weapons like this that require a small group of soldiers to operate and maintain are called crew-served weapons. 
chambered in 7.62 by 51 mm coincidentally the same round as the GE minigun, the M60 machine gun's design and function stemmed from an earlier prototype deemed the T-44. The T-44 was an experimental gun and never saw combat. The M60 was meant to supplant the M1918 Browning machine gun in the role of a heavier automatic weapon that could be used for sustained fire. The M60's barrel is actually interchangeable. This gives a firing soldier the ability to keep the barrels cool by swapping them out periodically. The upside to this is that the gun can be kept actively firing for longer periods of time. The downside is that the front sight is attached to the barrel, so that once the weapon is sighted in, a barrel swap could potentially change the point of impact. Also, to swap a hot barrel, the crewman responsible for the change would have to keep an asbestos glove on hand to prevent burns. Note the bipod attachment as well, which folded beneath the M60 and allows the shooter a stable platform for prone firing. The M60 could be shoulder fired as well, as its weight helps mitigate some of the recoil. It fires from an open bolt position. Open bolts are used to keep guns cool during high cyclic rates of fire. This was considered an optimum design for the M60 as it would be firing for extended periods of time. While I can't attest to the tree cutting ability of the M60, with a rate of fire approaching 650 rounds per minute, Mac was able to wound the Predator enough so that it bled. Arnie later concludes, If it bleeds, we can kill it. and sets into motion the final showdown. The original Predator continues to signify, for me at least, a time when all the monsters that lurked in my nightmares were fake ones, and I could count on heroes like Arnold to eradicate them. Maybe not so much anymore as an adult, but at least when I watch movies like this, I can believe it for the time that I'm immersed in the film. Thanks for watching. Please make sure that you like, subscribe, and hit the notification button.